Will Gloriofsky, if it isn't you. And of course, you know who I am, so I don't have to say. Of course, it'd be embarrassing if you didn't know who I was. So I'll just tell you. Yes, I am Randy Jimmy James Bowles, and I've got the flannel on. I'm trying to go for a rural, an old man type of vibe. Because the story that I'm going to tell will be better illustrated, better told if, I, if I'm if i like this. But the trouble is, it's I'm so young and hip and youthful that People say I don't really pull off the old man vibe very well. Please say that. I'm going to read a story to you that I wrote. I'm going to have to get close to the screen for this one. So, uh, <laughs> I feel sorry for you. But as I always say, close your eyes and just sit back and enjoy. Because you don't really have to have your eyes open. In fact, the pictures will come to you better if when you hear my words, if perhaps you just sit back, relax, and close your eyes. Now let me start reading this story to you, entitled, Closing Night at Yakima's Central Washington Fair, 1963. And Yakima would be Yakima, Washington. I live in the state of Washington, and I lived for quite some time in Yakima. In fact, in 1963, when I was 14, just barely into my teen years, I had an inside look at the Carney World at the Central Washington Fair in Yakima. And I aim to share my story here. I had a friend named Jake who lived in a profoundly run-down house by Bachelor Crick. We say Crick in Yakima. You might say Creek. The popular trout fishing hole where mostly young people fished. I met Jake on a hot Yakima, Washington summer day, circa 1961, when I was attempting to lure a fish onto my line, something I loved to do even though I was rarely successful. I loved being outdoors, fishing pole in hand, fantasizing about catching a lunker. Actually, I had never seen anyone pull a sizable fish out of that creek, but I figured there was always a first time. Jake was probably 17 or 18, so he was three or four years older than me. He was fairly tall, slightly chubby, an adolescent, and he had a very distinguishing feature. A piece of his left ear was missing. It looked like someone had taken a bite out of it. If having a chunk of ear missing bothered him, Jake never let it show. I don't know if he was actually bitten or not, because I certainly wasn't going to ask him and he didn't volunteer the information. Jake came from a dirt-poor family. The old house they called home near the creek looked like it hadn't been painted in, painted in 30 years. It had no yard, no fence, few trees. It was simply a crummy, run-down house, just sitting there, looking like it was engaged in a battle to not collapse under its own weight. Reminiscent of Stuart Hamlin's song, this old house. But Jake seemed quite happy with his lot in life. He was never fashionably dressed, but his clothes were clean, and he was good-natured, always kind to me, and generous with what he had. Since we, weren't, since we weren't classmates and didn't live near each other, we didn't socialize on a regular basis. We managed by happenstance to occasionally bump into each other. And we were glad when this occurred, we seemed to just take up where we left off, regardless of how long it had been between visits. I had close friends whom I saw every day, but Jake and I had a special bond in spite of not having that daily contact. He was very countryfied. He reminded me of a character right out of the Grapes of Wrath. My daddy had been a country preacher as well as a country radio DJ. I know that's an odd combination. He was also a rock disc jockey. But anyway, I was very comfortable around country people. Plus, I spent my early childhood living in the idyllic hamlet of Lower Natchez, Washington. Perhaps this is why Jake and I were simpatico. 
In the fall of 1963, the Central Washington Fair was the big attraction. I so loved the fair. I never visited for just one day. I always went three or four days every year. I either made the round trip with my red bicycle, which I had won on the Uncle Jimmy TV show, or I caught the bus mark fair special. I remember being at the 63 fair on the last night of its run. Darkness had just fallen on Yakima. I was meandering around, caught up in the sights, sounds, and smells of the Meeker Carnival Midway. The Meeker family ran the fair's carnival for years. I loved it all, the sawdust covering the ground, the smell of hamburgers frying, the music of the merry-go-round, and especially the ballyhoo of the carnies, who would do or say anything, making all manner of promises to lure visitor, visitors to their particular attraction. Well, I happened to run into Jake that evening. We happily greeted each other. Then he asked me to accompany him to a special tent. He said he was working at the fair and he was on his way to the Carnival Cookhouse, a place set, set aside exclusively for hungry carnies. So we walked over to the tent and chose a little oilcloth draped table. The cook, a middle-aged, stern-looking woman, came right over. She and Jake were apparently well acquainted because the moment we sat down, she lit into him. It turned out my pal was working as a jointee. That is, Jake was employed at one of the carnival games, and he had just up and quit. I learned this from listening to their back and forth. Jake had, de Jake had decided he was too tuckered out from working the game during the fair's run to stay and help tear down the joints, game tents, and other temporary structures put up for the fair. Instead, he decided to pack it in, and head to the cookhouse for some victuals. Well, the cook asked him, How can you quit on slough out night? Slough rhymes with cow. It means tear down time. She said, You can't quit on slough out night. But Jake insisted he was too tired to do another lick of work. He was going to get his pay, and he was hoping for maybe a bite to eat. So the cook said in a very matter-of-fact way, you will never, ever work this carnival again because you quit on slough out night. You're finished with this outfit. Done. I mean, she was dead serious, and she read him the riot act. Then, having said her piece, she proceeded to retrieve a huge plate of fried chicken from the kitchen, place it on the table, turn and walk quickly away. Jake, ever the generous fellow, said, here, have some, Randy. And it was the best fried chicken I ever ate. Okay, here's a disclaimer. The truth is it's been so long, I can't really recall my friend's name, so I called him Jake. Second disclaimer. I became a vegetarian in 1974 and have not tasted chicken since. And no, I don't miss it. Stay excellent.